Well, hello, Pastor Brian Diffie here, First United Methodist Church, Cross of Arkansas, and I want to welcome you once again to our Wednesday night, family night out uh, Bible study. Uh, we are concluding our look at the Gospel of Mark. It seems like a long time that we've been in the Gospel of Mark, but we are finally coming to the conclusion uh, this evening. Um, thought long and hard about uh, what to do next. Normally in the springtime, uh, we uh, conclude our Wednesday night family night out for the year. Uh, things are getting busy with kids and sports and upcoming uh, spring and summer activities. Uh, but due to the fact that we continue to be uh, socially isolated and not able to uh, join together in a physical way, I'm going to continue uh, with this uh, platform until uh, we can come back together again. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, beginning a study starting next week on Wednesday nights uh, on the book of Jonah. Uh, this is going to be a short study uh, for about a four or five week study, but we're going to be looking at Jonah and what God has to say to us through that text. But I, I'm thankful that you have uh, stuck with us uh, this far. Uh, we started out physically together and then moved online. And like I said, tonight we are completing the Gospel of Mark. And as I said last week, hold on. The best is yet to come. The good news of God is about to be revealed here in the Gospel of Mark. So I invite you to grab a copy of uh, the scripture, or there will be uh, scripture on the screen as we have done in the past weeks. Uh, so grab a copy of the scripture, join me as we go to God in prayer, and then we will get started with our study of the Gospel of Mark. Let's pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for every opportunity that we have uh, to study your word. We are thankful for uh, the life that it gives to us, the insight that it gives to us, uh, the transformative power that this book, that these words have upon our lives. So we pray, oh God, that as you speak this evening, uh, we can truly hear what you are saying and we can respond in a way that brings honor and glory to you and that deepens our discipleship as we seek to call others into discipleship as well. Thank you, O God, for this time. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. All right, let me bring up the uh, copy of the scripture on the screen, and then we will uh, begin our study. Okay, here we go. Uh, we left off last week in the 40th verse of the 15th chapter. And here's what we see. And this um, is after um, Jesus's death on the cross. He's been crucified by the Romans. And in the 40th verse, it says, some women were watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger one, and Joseph and Salome. When Jesus was in Galilee, these women had followed and supported him, along with many other women who had come to Jerusalem with him. 42nd, since it was late in the afternoon on preparation day, just before the Sabbath, Joseph from Arimathea dared to approach Pilate and ask for Jesus's body. Now, I find that word choice there uh, to be very telling. You know, last week we talked about Pilate and who he was and how ruthless he was, and you didn't get to the position that Pilate is in by being a nice, weak-willed individual. He is someone who is intimidating. That is why I think the word dared to approach Pilate from Joseph of Arimathea's viewpoint, or from the viewpoint of the writer of Mark, is a very, very uh, correct. Uh, he dared to approach Pilate to ask for Jesus's body. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, if you will remember, is a member of the council. 
and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he comes, comes and he asks for Jesus's body. And, and Joseph is an interesting and ambiguous character who appears in all four gospels at Jesus's burial. Um, in other places, he's called a disciple, though a closeted one. It's not clear in Mark that he's a disciple. He may be merely a compassionate man or a Jew who doesn't want the body to defile the Sabbath. What is clear is that this stranger, rather than Jesus's closest friends, provides for Jesus's burial. Now, two of the women disciples witness the event, so they want to know, uh, so that they will know, uh, the tomb's location. They want to know where Jesus is going to be buried. And Pilate wondered if Jesus was already dead. Uh, it, sometimes it took a while for someone to die from crucifixion, sometimes days. And he called the centurion and asked him whether Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, Pilate gave the dead body to Joseph. And so Joseph bought a linen cloth, took Jesus uh, down from the cross, wrapped him in the cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been carved out of a rock. He rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was buried. Then we come to the point of the resurrection. Now, there has been so much darkness in this story. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is told in a matter of fact, in a matter of fact type of way. Um, it is very dark, it is very stark, it is not detailed, it just wants to get the story out there. And there is a lot of darkness in the story that we may sense a first, uh, a, a flicker of hope now that the sun has come up again. Maybe today is going to be different than tomorrow. You ever had those instances where you go through a day and that day is horrible and you go to bed and you just pray uh, that tomorrow will be better, that you might find some type of hope? I imagine this might be how uh, the women went to bed that night. And when the Sabbath was over, it starts in the 16th verse. Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus's body. Now, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And Mark wants us to know this was a very large stone. So this just isn't anyone who was able to do this. This, this is miraculous. And so maybe, maybe just maybe the prayer of the women had been answered. Maybe this is going to be a better day than yesterday. Let's read and find out. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Now, they come into the tomb. They find a young man dressed in a white robe, which is the clothing of vindicated martyrs. And then he announces that one final prediction of Jesus is satisfied. He tells the women that Jesus is not here. You are looking for him. He is not here. Now, let's stop right there and think about this. When was the last time we saw a young man in a white robe or a linen cloth? The garden, the garden of Gethsemane. The last time that we saw a young man in a white robe, he was running away naked 
from the Garden of Gethsemane. What's, what's this to mean? You know, we talked about that nakedness was in Jewish understanding. It, it was an equivalent to shame. Uh, nakedness and shame went hand in hand. And this man, his clothing had been snatched off and he ran away naked. And maybe that could symbolize the disciples running away in shame and fear. But now we see a young man who is clothed. You see the difference there? With Christ, we may run away with shame, but Christ will find us and clothe us with a garment of praise, a garment of forgiveness, a garment of hope. And he tells the women, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. So he's telling them that Jesus, he's going ahead of you to Galilee, so if you go to Galilee, you will see him there. And overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. End of story. That's the end of Mark. That's it. That is the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. Now, much has been said. Uh, a lot of scholarly debate has happened regarding the ending of Mark's Gospel. We are told nothing more. The best manuscripts of Mark end at 16.8. Modern English Bible translations usually include a shorter and a longer ending, but these were added in the fourth and late second centuries, respectively. Now, the issue becomes this. And this is why that we may find longer endings of Mark. It may have not been satisfactory to some folks to end Mark in that manner. Mark may be most like ancient biographies, but that doesn't mean Mark was writing primarily as a biographer. It's more likely that Mark wrote this gospel as a pastor or a teacher or a spiritual guide to challenge and encourage Christians as they follow Jesus on the way of the Lord. Spiritual teachings or guidance are often left open-ended, leaving disciples a conundrum to resolve or a question to answer. What do you mean they ran away and they were afraid? Why didn't they go tell someone? You know, uh, Charles Dickens asked this question of why this was left open-ended, and that was his inspiration to write A Christmas Carol, to tell what happens to someone's life when they embrace the principles, the teachings of Jesus. But let's return to the words of the young man in the tomb. These are very important words. He says to the women, before they run away, that if you will go to Galilee, you're going to see Jesus. He knew the women were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. And he tells them, he has been raised. 
He is not here. Now, many of us um, have weak resurrection theologies. And I appreciate the writings and the insight of Dr. Mitzi Minor, whom we spoke of uh, just the other day, um, who has done extensive work in research and writing in the Gospel of Mark. And, and she points out the fact of our weak resurrection theologies. We often imagine that on Easter morning, Jesus woke up, stretched, yawned, and walked out of the tomb. That view, however, is closer to resuscitation than to the proclamation that Jesus was resurrected. We need to see the difference between resurrection and resuscitation. If you see here, in this text, this man doesn't say that Jesus got up. He says that he has been raised. He isn't here. If for Mark, resurrection is an apocalyptic event that happens at the end of the present age and the start of the age to come, and Jesus if he is raised and resurrected, what does that tell us? The present age is already passing away, and the new age has begun. Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of God is drawn near is therefore dramatically confirmed. When Jesus was raised, what do you think happened? the old world has been done away with. We are now ushered into a new world, a new reality. We only live in that old world that has been done away with if we refuse to believe and live into the fact that Jesus has been raised, and we can be too. You remember what Jesus talked a lot about? The kingdom of God, entering into that kingdom of God. That means that we cast off the citizenship of the old life, the old kingdom, and we become citizens of that new kingdom. We take off the old, we embrace the new. Paul would talk about this in his writings in the New Testament in that my old self has died and the new self has been born. Jesus, not, not taking into account and not trying to read another gospel into this one because we're looking at Mark's gospel alone. If you remember the conversation that Mark had with Nicodemus, he told him, you must be born again. This is being born again allowing our old self to be in a tomb, to be dead, to be buried, and then for us to be raised to new life with Christ. So, if these women go to Galilee, they will see the resurrected Jesus. Galilee brings to mind Jesus' journey through that re region, and from there to Gentile areas, crossing boundaries, sharing bread, announcing that God's kingdom is drawn near. It is not only a place, but also a symbol of Jesus' mission. If the disciples go there, they will see him. What kind of seeing? What if this is just not seeing an appearance of the resurrected Jesus with their physical eyes, but the kind of seeing Mark has been calling for all along? What if they go to Galilee in the sense of joining themselves to Jesus' mission and see that Jesus is resurrected? That is, the age to come has arrived. The renewal of creation is possible and is happening, and they are a part of it. These may be the implications of the young man's words to the women. This section defines what God is calling all of us who follow the resurrected one to do. This is the kind of life and ministry that we are called to be a part of. But instead of going to Galilee, 
the women fleeing in fear and silence. And I think that suggests there is a flip side to consider. Think of the advantages for them if Jesus stayed dead. Any hatred they felt towards the religious leaders or Roman officials could be justified since those people killed someone they loved. The same would be true of any vengeance they might plot. Or they could understandably think nothing ever changes, so why bother? And just go home to the lives they led before Jesus. How much easier it would be if he just stayed dead rather than being resurrected, returning to Galilee and calling them to follow. For if he is resurrected, then God is indeed at work drawing the kingdom near. Nothing will ever be the same, including their lives. It may be that this kind of insight has scared the women speechless. Mark's ending does not give us that closure. Instead, it leaves us unsettled, wondering with unanswered questions, how could they? Did they never tell? What should they have done? Sooner or later, we may get around to, well, if I'd been there, what would I have done? Maybe that's the point. Are we ready to see that Jesus is resurrected? The kingdom of God has drawn near and the renewal of all creation is underway? Are we ready to cross boundaries, share our bread, practice the radical inclusivity of God's kingdom, serve one another, cast out evil, heal and forgive? Are we ready to bear suffering at the hands of those invested in the world as the human powers have ordered it? Through Mark's story, we are there. For these words, he has been raised. Go to Galilee. There you will see him. So as this study ends and you walk out the door, are you headed in the direction of Galilee? Are we headed in the direction of Galilee? But not to leave you um, without seeing the rest of this text. I want to share with you what the rest of the text actually is about. If we can get there. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Endings added later. Here's what they said. They promptly reported all the young man's instructions, but they ran away with fear and said nothing to no one. And then they promptly reported, but that doesn't fit in with the rest of the text. But here are the things that Jesus says that they will do. Go into the whole world, proclaim the good news to every creature. Uh, you'll see pick up snakes, their hands, drink anything poisonous, will not hurt you, place their hands on the sick and get well. And all of this was an attempt to really help the women fulfill their task. But that's not the point. The point is, is that you and I are to continue, continue the teachings of Jesus, continue to living that type of life that we just talked about a moment ago cross boundaries, share bread, practice radical inclusivity of God's kingdom, serve one another, cast out evil, heal and forgive. Are we ready to do this? Are we ready to serve? Are we ready to love? Are we ready to be who God has called us to be? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. And I think that's why Mark originally ended with the eighth verse. 
because some things are supposed to cause us to say, why didn't they go and tell? Somebody needs to know, why can't that be me? And I pray that that will be you. I pray that you will choose to continue the ministry of what we have learned in the Gospel of Mark. I pray that you'll join us back here next week as we begin our look at the uh, writings in Jonah. I know that once again, we will be blessed. Join me in a word of prayer. Oh God, we give you thanks for sharing with us this evening, uh, for opening our hearts and our lives and helping us to, uh, uh, to be and to see and help us not to be as the women in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, uh, to run away in fear and say nothing to no one, uh, but, oh God, help us to go and share and to love and to serve. We pray all this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. All right. Uh, see you next week.